Hi, I'm Laurieann Lallum, and I'm a professor of history at Minnesota State University, Mankato. I will note that I'm originally from North Dakota, having grown up in Lemoore County. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about women's suffrage in Dakota Territory. Before I begin kind of the formal presentation, I want to provide just a little bit of context for where I'm coming from. In October of 2019, South Dakota Historical Society Press published Equality at the Ballot Box, Votes for Women on the Northern Great Plains. This is a volume that Molly Rosen of the University of South Dakota and I uh, edited. And you can see here the states in the Northern Great Plains, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, and, and Montana. And one of the things that became clear as Molly and I worked on this collection is that the territorial period played a crucially important role laying foundations for women's suffrage successes in statehood. First, it was easier to enact women's suffrage measures, both full and partial suffrage, during the territorial period. And this was because it only required a positive vote in the legislature, and then of course, the governor signing the bill. It did not requ require a vote of settler men. And that's going to be a crucial distinction between ter the territorial period and statehood. And this is because male suffrage rights became encoded in state constitutions, which meant that for women's suffrage to become a reality, there would have to be an amended change to the state constitution to, remo to remove the word male. And this is a much harder proposition than merely getting legislation through the territorial legislature, for example. Second, on the Northern Great Plains, suffrage rights gained during the territorial period became part of the constitutions of Wyoming, Montana, North Dakota, and South Dakota. As Ruth Page Jones has noted in her work on school suffrage, having access to the ballots in territorial days became a way for women to demonstrate that they engaged with the political process and that they voted. So with this brief comment, I'm going to begin talking about women's suffrage in Dakota Territory specifically. In early 1868, during the 1868-1869 legislative session, and originally the legislative session met in December and January, so that's why we have 1868-1869. But in early December 1868, Anna Stutzman, a delegate from Pembina to the Dakota Territory House of Representatives, introduced House Bill Number 28, quote, to confer upon women elective franchise and the eligibility to office, unquote, for women 18 and older. And this meant that women would be able to vote and that women would also be able to hold office. This legislation was the first women's suffrage legislation put forth in a territorial legislature on the Northern Great Plains. And it was one of the earliest serious efforts to enfranchise women. There was an earlier effort in Kansas, for example, and there had been legislation introduced in various state legislatures, but they didn't go very far. This is actually a really important development in 1868-1869. The Union and Dakotian in Yankton declared that Stutzman's suffrage legislation was, quote, the most radical measure yet introduced in the House, unquote. In a subsequent issue, the newspaper noted that the measure had support and might pass. Should this happen, quote, Dakota will at once attain notoriety. It will be sort of a mecca, a political haven towards which all the strong-minded like Susan B. Anthony and those of the Re Revolution Stripe will immediately direct their steps, unquote. And here you can see this is the early Dakota territorial legislature. The legislature met in Yankton. To be sure, opponents of woman suffrage sought to defeat the bill. The bill made it out of Stutzman's Committee on Elections, but some thought a wider discussion prudent before having a House vote. 
When Stutzman requested a special meeting of the Committee of the Whole House, he commented that some members, quote, believe this measure so far in advance of old fogey notions, unquote, and requested the special meeting. In the end, the House passed the bill by a vote of 14 to 9 on the 23rd of December. The following day, Christmas Eve, the bill went to the council and had two readings. Members of the upper house, the council, were more reluctant to support woman suffrage than delegates to the lower house. When debate on the bill began, Charles Ross Tesher, a brewer from Yankton, an opponent of woman's suffrage, put forth a resolution calling for women in the territory to speak on the floor of the council about the House bill because women like Anthony couldn't get there in time. Council members defeated the resolution. Ross Tesher then maneuvered a competing suffrage bill through the council and it passed in early January 1869. The House defeated the bill with many of the delegates, including Stutzman, who supported the initial House bill voting against the council version. That should be a clue that there's a problem with the council bill. Dakota Territorial Suffragist Alice Pickler, and she has a long suffrage career in the southern portion of the territory and in South Dakota. Alice Pickler suspected that the council bill may have been, quote, a burlesque, unquote, and thought, quote, the entire action of the council was prompted by a spirit of mischief, unquote. Pickler didn't live in Dakota Territory at the time and relayed this story as she had heard it from settlers who had been here. The skepticism surrounded the council bill centers on the requirement for male voters in the territory to vote on the legislation, a sure defeat for the measure. Keep in mind the immigrant men who had filed their intent to become a citizen, and that means they've taken out their first naturalization papers but were not citizens, that these men met the voting requirement in Dakota Territory. And there were lots of immigrants who took out first papers because that was a requirement in order to homestead or at a little later date to take out other government land. Um, or participate in other government land programs. And there was no requirement that someone actually became a citizen, just that you had filed your first papers. And in Dakota Territory, men who had filed first papers but who were not citizens could vote. And so voting was not restricted to citizens in Dakota Territory. This is an article that appeared in the Petroleum Cent Center um, Daily, and Petroleum Center is in Pennsylvania. And this is the most significant of the articles that I found um, about the council action in 1869. There are a number of brief snippets, and this is all in Chronicling America, that, that mention that the bill was defeated in the House, that the bill passed, or excuse me, that the bill passed the House, and then um, says something that the House bill wasn't um, passed by the, by the council. There are also a number of erroneous accounts, particularly in February and March, indicating that woman suffrage did in fact pass the Dakota Territorial Legislature, which that is not, not the case because there were these two competing bills. What I like about this um, brief article is that it succinctly lays out what the problem was. Um, that this wasn't a serious effort on the part of those in the council because by requiring a vote of the men in the territory, women's suffrage would be defeated. So thus, in January of 1869, woman suffrage died in the eighth session of the Dakota Territory Legislature. According to George Kingsbury, settler women expressed their quote-unquote disappointment with the council's failure to pass the House bill. 
The Dakota Territory Legislature's actions in 1868-1869 are largely unknown to scholars and to the general public. And I mention this because I have not seen reference to this 1868-1869 legislative action in any kind of scholarly treatment on women's suffrage. Clearly, someone like Kingsbury includes it in, you know, history of Dakota Territory, but in later scholarly treatments, this is largely forgotten, and yet this is a really important um, development. And I must confess, I was one of those scholars. I did not know about Stutzman's legislation, and I grew up right next to Stutzman, Stutzman County. Uh, Molly and I learned about this as we were working on the project. And this is where really Chronicling America, which is a digital newspaper database that the Library of Congress has created, has been central to a lot of the research that scholars who contributed to equality at the ballot box used. So why did Stutzman introduce the suffrage legislation? Uh, it's not clear. Born in Indiana and reared in Illinois, Stutzman became an attorney and struck out for the West, first in Iowa, and he did have family there, and then as an early settler in Southern Dakota Territory. He worked as an attorney and land speculator in Yankton, as well as represented Yankton in the Dakota Territorial Legislative Council. Anna Stutzman was a Democrat. He was also politically adroit and engaged in political machinations at the highest levels in the territory. In the mid-18, <coughs> excuse me, in the mid-1860s, he received an appointment from the Johnson administration as a special customs agent in Pembina, and Johnson was also a Democrat. Pembina, a community with a large Métis population and connections to the fur trade through the Hudson's Bay Company, strategically lay near the border of Rupert's Land, now a portion of which is Manitoba. Smuggling was a problem in the borderlands. Stutzman secured the appointment of Isabella Cavalier as an agent because of, quote, a regular system of smuggling that has been carried on through the agency of women, unquote. To combat this system of smuggling, Stutzman needed a woman agent, and he actively lobbied for her hiring. Does Stutzman's support for a woman customs aid inspector reflect a broader support for women's rights? Is this about securing a position for a friend? Uh, he lived with the Cavaliers. He knew the Cavaliers extremely well. Is it a little bit of both? According to Stutzman's biographer, Gail, Dale Gibson, it's inconclusive. Gibson contends that Stutzman may have indeed been a supporter of women's suffrage. But he may have seen a political reward for introducing the suffrage bill. Two of Stutzman's close political allies were Andrew Jackson Falk, the territorial governor of Dakota in 1868, and Falk's son-in-law, Dr. Walter A. Burley. And clearly with a name like Andrew Jackson Falk, the Falk family supported the Democratic Party. And Falk had been a Democrat, but he joined the Republican Party shortly after it organized in 1854. Likewise, Anna, Stutz, Anna Stutzman had all kinds of connections with Republican Party um, politicians in Dakota Territory. Uh, perhaps his status as a Democrat is a little bit nebulous, um, particularly later on in Dakota Territory. The introduction of women's suffrage legislation is also situated within the context of Reconstruction in the period after the Civil War. Jennifer Helton is reconceiving women's suffrage in Wyoming by arguing it's part of a broader Reconstruction effort by radical Republicans. 
many radical Republicans didn't just oppose the enslavement of African Americans and abolition. They supported other progressive reforms of the day, including suffrage rights for African Americans and suffrage rights for women. The Dakota Territory Constitution originally restricted voting right, rights to white men. In 1867, Congress changed the territorial organic rights to require voting rights for African-American men. That same year, Dakota Territory quickly changed its constitution to enfranchise African-American men. In Montana Territory, on the other hand, the change came more slowly and with considerable pushback, in large part because there were many more people from slaveholding states who settled in Montana territory, largely because of mining, than who settled in Dakota territory. Wyoming territory granted women full suffrage rights in December of 1869, and this was the first in the nation and Utah Territory followed quickly in February of 1870. So if we look early at early 1870, the future seems really bright for woman suffrage, and yet it's still going to take until 1920 for full suffrage rights to be enacted in the United States. And even then, um, there are women who are going to be excluded from, vo from voting for a variety of, of um, reasons. While Stutzman's bill in the 1868-1869 legislature failed, in the next few territorial legislative sessions, Dakota Territory considered such legislation. No bill, however, made it out of the legislature, although in the 1871-1872 session, it came close when the measure lost by one vote. Like women in other states and territories, in the, eight, in the late 1870s, progress had been made in terms of some settler women acquiring school suffrage rights. The legislature passed three different measures connected to women's school suffrage in 1879, 1883, and 1887. I'm not really going to talk about the specific school suffrage laws, but I do want to make it clear that this did not that these laws did not provide universal school suffrage to women. There were restrictions in terms of who could vote. The 1879 law um, allowed women to vote at school meetings, and that's a different kind of a process because you're at a school meeting and maybe there's some kind of decision that's being made in terms of of um, providing funding for textbooks or something like that. Um, the legislation in 1887 uh, expanded somewhat significantly voting rights for um, women on school matters. Women and male supporters, however, continued to lobby for full franchise rights for women. When men in Southern Dakota Territory met in Sioux Falls in 1883 to create a constitution with an eye on statehood, and they envisioned a state named Dakota, and this was based on the southern uh, portion of the territory. When they met, local suffrage supporters and national advocates sought to include women's suffrage in the governing document. Marietta Bones, a member of the Women's Christian Temperance Union and Dakota Territory Vice President of the National Women's Suffrage Association, actively lobbied for inclusion of a prohibition plank in the Constitution, as well as to exclude the word male when defining voting rights. The Kimball Graphic, which is a newspaper in Southern Dakota Territory, thought Bones would be an, um, quote, omnipresent member of the lobby, unquote. Bones specifically asked for time to, to address the convention, and she did. In her remarks, she, quote, appealed to your, referring to the male delegates, justice in behalf of the women of our territory who are opposed to being left in our state organization with no more authority and self-government than have the paupers and the idiots, unquote. 
she went on to proclaim that women, quote, are willing to do one half of the manual labor in the country and will promptly pay our portion of the taxes, unquote. Bones argued that voting wasn't a privilege, but a right of citizenship. And women citizens should have that right. And this actually predates an argument that's going to become much more prevalent in the early 20th century. This notion that voting rights should be connected with citizenship rights. According to Bones, if women had the franchise, they would use it, which may have been what concerned some men. She also addressed what would be a significant issue in Dakota Territory, male immigrants who could vote. Finally, Bones used Wyoming Territory as an example of woman suffrage success that the state of Dakota should emulate. And of course, as we know, statehood would not be achieved in 1883. <laughs> in Marietta Bones on the right and Alice Pickler on the left, the nexus of women's suffrage and the WCTU is highlighted. Indeed, one of the characteristics of women's suffrage in Dakota Territory, as well as in North and South Dakota, is the linkage of franchise rights for women with temperance and prohibition measures. This linkage during the territorial period continued in statehood. Indeed, many men who supported women's suffrage also wished for temperance or prohibition laws. While men at the 1883 Dakota Constitutional Convention listened to Marietta Bones champion voting rights for women, they also participated in a serious debate over whether temperance, prohibition, or no such measures would be a part of the Constitution. Newspapers reported very little on women's suffrage at the convention, but devoted a lot of space to temperance and prohibition debates. Two years later, after two years after Bones spoke at the Dakota Constitutional Convention, members of the territorial legislature met in Bismarck. And as you may know, the capital moved from Yankton to Bismarck in 1883. And in many ways, it's this move of the capital to Bismarck that is really fueling suffrage efforts in the southern um, portion of the, of the territory or I shouldn't say suffrage efforts, statehood efforts in the southern portion of the, of the territory. So in 1885, members of the territorial legislature met in Bismarck. Major John Pickler, husband of the aforementioned Alice, submitted a woman's suffrage bill in the House. The bill, while granting women the right to vote, would not allow women to stand for election for most elective offices. The Bismarck Tribune covered the legislature and took great pleasure in ridiculing and emasculating some of the strongest supporters of the suffrage bill in a column called Legislative Gossip. The reporter recounted the debate on the House floor that resulted in the bill's passage. The men selected for ridicule were Major John Pickler, a.k.a. Susan B. Pickler of Falk County, Vischer Veer Barnes, or V.V. Barnes, of Kingsbury County, who was referred to as Belva Barnes, and that's after Belva Lockwood, a suffragist, and John Blakemore, of Hyde County, who was referred to as, as Elizabeth Cady Blakemore after Elizabeth Cady Stanton. All of the men resided in Southern Dakota Territory. The Bismarck Tribune reported that Miss Susan B. Pickler introduced the bill and, quote, she made an eloquent plea. The author, unquote, the author consistently used female pronouns and language often used to stereotype women. With Pickler, for example, he wrote that he was, quote, the fair speaker, unquote. The report 
Peter conceded that Pickler made legitimate claims, for example, taxation without representation. Pickler also made the argument that if women voted, the electoral process would be quote unquote purified and that the work of the government would be elevated. Years later, Pickler recalled that he looked at being called the Susan B. Pickler as one of the greatest, as quote, one of the greatest honors bestowed upon him. And you can see here, this is just a brief excerpt. This is an extremely long article that covers a page, a couple of pages in the Bismarck Tribune. And you can see here the kind of language that's, that's um, being used. I will add that while the Bismarck Tribune was hostile to woman suffrage, there were other newspapers in North Dakota, like the Bismarck Journal and particularly the Jamestown Weekly Alert, which was a Farmers Alliance newspaper, uh, that were very supportive of woman suffrage efforts. Lakemore also argued that the political process would be less corrupt if women voted. The reporter described him as, quote, Elizabeth Cady Blakemore, with a slight whisk of her beings and readjustment of her bustle, was the next gentle defender of the bill, unquote. And Vivi Barnes, or Belva Barnes, used taxation without representation as the mantra for why um, women's suffrage should be enacted. I'll also add with Barnes, he knew Charles Ings Ingalls. He came from um, Kingsbury County and Charles Ingalls, of course, Laura Ingalls Wilder's uh, father. The more interesting account is the description of how Henry W. Coe of Mandan in Northern Dakota Territory came to support the bill. He did not support women's suffrage originally, but his wife did. Because of the close proximity of Bismarck and Mandan, Coe spent time with his family during, during the session, and he learned that his wife supported the suffrage measure. He also noted that the Republican Party, quote, is the party of progress, unquote. According to Cole, quote, as a Democrat was in favor of this progressive measure, he would not be outdone, unquote. And thus, he voted for the suffrage bill. It's really a remarkable article that explains why some people in the legislature, men in the legislature voted in favor of the bill, quote, the ladies wanted it, unquote, or voted against the bill, quote, the ladies didn't want it, unquote. The bill passed the House by a vote of 29 to 18. One member didn't participate. There is a difference, though, in terms of northern and southern um, territorial delegates and their level of support. 66% of the delegates from Southern Dakota Territory supported the measure compared with 53% of Northern delegates. The account in the Bismarck Tribune is important for a number of reasons. First, it provides a detailed account of what transpired on the floor of the Dakota Territorial House. The House Journal merely indicates the introduction of the bill and the votes on the legislation, but not the actual debate. The Journal does provide petitions submitted into the record, which in the case of women's, uh, women's suffrage, tells us where people organized in support of the legislation. And I can tell you that most of the petitions came from the southern portion of the territory. Second, it lays out key arguments connected to women's suffrage in the territory, and it points to topics for further inquiry. The council passed the Pickler bill after considerable, considerable debate by a vote of 14 yes to 10 no. For a while, it appeared the council would adopt a different bill, one that required a vote of men in the territory, just like the council did in 1869. 
In the end, however, the council removed that amendment to the House bill and the legislation passed. Newspapers throughout the United States reported on the suffrage success. It seemed like women's suffrage was going to happen in Dakota Territory. The jubilation of the legislative victory was short-lived, however. Governor Gilbert A. Pierce, who had recently been appointed to the position, vetoed the bill. Primary among his objections, Pierce believed women's suffrage should be a result of the vote of the people. He noted that Congress could enact legislation in franchising women, but it hadn't. And he expressed concern that territories passing such legislation put their bids for statehood in jeopardy. And this actually was something that even men who supported women's suffrage would articulate as a concern, that there was a fear that if women's suffrage existed, if it were part of a state constitution when a state applied for, or when a territory applied for statehood, that the bid would fail. Finally, in terms of big picture objectives, Pierce asserted that women themselves should be able to determine whether or not they, quote, should assume this burden or not, unquote. He implied that for women, the, quote, burden and responsibility, unquote, of voting rights would be overwhelming. Pierce also found problematic a specific feature of the legislation, that it denied women the opportunity to hold office. In effect, if you're giving women the right to vote, and if women are qualified to vote, shouldn't women then be qualified to hold public office? Suffrage supporters, like John Pickler, prepared to override the governor's veto. Alas, that would not happen. Only 19 men in the House voted to override the veto, including Henry Coe of Mandan. 26 cast votes in support of the governor's action. The rebuke of Pierce's veto came quickly. In a letter to the St. Paul Globe, Marietta Bones excoriated Pierce's action, referring to him as an outsider, quote, who was wholly unacquainted with our people and their needs, unquote, and offering that Dakota was, quote, in no hurry, no hurry whatever to be admitted to the, United, or to the Union as a state, unquote. In that, she is incorrect. Suffragists throughout the United States mobilized and contacted President Grover Cleveland with a request to remove Pierce. A resolution in the new era called Pierce, one, quote, among the obstructionists to the human liberty, unquote. When the American Woman Suffrage Association met in Minneapolis in the fall of 1885, it featured Major John Pickler as one of the speakers, and the AWSA expressed its dissatisfaction with Pierce. Alice Pickler was also a delegate to the AWSA um, conference, as was Sarah Lyman and Mrs. J.N. Melton. They all hailed from Southern Dakota Territory. And you can see here the res one of the resolutions resolved that our special thanks are due to Major J. Pickler and the majority of both houses in the Dakota legislature who extended suffrage last spring to the women of that territory. And we trust that the liberty loving men of Dakota will secure the removal of the unfaithful governor of Dakota who by his veto remanded 50,000 women of Dakota to continued disenfranchisement. To underscore how frustrated suffragists were with the veto, after Pierce's death in 1901, Susan B. Anthony wrote a letter to her friend, Alice Pickler, in which she commented on the former governor's death in a postscript and noted that, quote, he cheated us out of suffrage for women in both of the Dakotas, unquote. She also asked Alice to greet Susan B. Pickler from her. 
I'll note that Gilbert A. Pierce and his wife supported woman's suffrage, although it's unclear if that were the case in 1885. Pierce later acknowledged he regretted his veto of the 1885 Dakota Territorial Woman's Suffrage legislation. And it only causes me to think, oh, what could have been? Um, the Dakotas could have come into the Union as suffrage states had Pierce not vetoed that legislation. After the defeat, of women's suffrage in 1885, efforts continued in the territory. Men in Southern Dakota Territory met that summer to craft a constitution for statehood. This constitution included a provision for men to vote on women's suffrage. Statehood, however, did not come in 1885. The 1887 territorial legislature failed to pass a woman's suffrage bill. The Bismarck Tribune continued to refer to Pickler as Susan B. Pickler, but now there was House member Elizabeth Moore and Senator Anna Dickinson Smith, again, um, both references to Elizabeth Cady Stanton and then Anna Dickinson, prominent suffragists, along with, quote, other distinguished ladies who favor the passage of the bill, unquote. In 1889, men met at constitutional conventions in Southern Dakota Territory, Northern Dakota Territory, Montana Territory, and Wyoming T Territory. Broadly speaking, elective rights women secured during the territorial period generally became a part of the state constitutions. Thus, in Wyoming, where women had won full suffrage rights in territorial days, they kept those rights albeit there had been some pushback. And maybe as an aside, well, North and South Dakota and Montana became states in 1889. Wyoming didn't become a state until 1890. Montana and the Dakotas all enacted forms of school suffrage as territories and included varying school suffrage rights for women in the state constitutions. Montana territory passed woman taxpayer suffrage during the territorial days, and it too became part of the state constitution. Although again, there was significant pushback, especially in the 1890s and early 20th century to woman taxpayer suffrage in Montana. Neither Montana nor the Dakotas created full suffrage rights for women in their state constitutions, although women and men tried mightily to do so. And perhaps as an aside, there was a serious effort, Cora um, Smith Eaton, although she was just Cora Smith at the time, and Henry Blackwell le um, lobbying the legislature in North Dakota were not able to get any kind of a guarantee. In South Dakota, although women's suffrage did not appear in the Constitution, there was a requirement that there would be a vote by men on women's suffrage in 1890. It would be easy to look at the end results of women's suffrage in Dakota Territory and proclaim it a failure, but I don't think that's an accurate assessment. During the 1868-1869, 1871-1872, and 1885 territorial legislative sessions, women nearly won the franchise in Dakota Territory. Indeed, but for a governor's veto, Woman's suffrage, although not office holding, would have become law. These territorial suffrage struggles created women and men committed to securing the franchise for women. For me, what's more interesting is that North and South Dakota had been one for nearly 30 years with the same suffrage history, but they had very different statehood suffrage stories. The fight for equality at the ballot box remained unfinished in Dakota Territory and continued in statehood. And I'd like to thank you all for attending this virtual presentation. I normally really enjoy the Q&A portion, but 
that's not going to happen. So if you do have questions, again, I'm on faculty in, in the history department at Minnesota State University, Mankato, and please feel free to shoot me an email and I will respond to your questions. Thanks again. Have a good week.